Leading Ideas Talks podcast is brought to you by the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Subscribe free to our weekly e-newsletter, Leading Ideas, at churchleadership.com slash leading ideas. Leading Ideas Talks is also brought to you by LPLI, a confidential online 360-degree leadership assessment instrument. LPLI is designed to help those working in the church identify individual strengths and weaknesses so they may improve their ministry effectiveness. LPLI is available in both pastor and church staff versions. Learn more at lpli.org. And remember, to stay up to date with the latest church leadership strategies and information, please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos. What is the state of clergy health and well-being coming out of the pandemic? And what factors and practices influence the emotional well-being of clergy? In this episode, Allison Norton describes new research that reveals growing discontentment, even though clergy health and well-being trends tend to be better than that of the general public. Welcome to Leading Ideas Talks. My name is Ann Michael. I'm a senior consultant with the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary, and I'm also one of the editors of our Leading Ideas e-newsletter. It's my privilege today to serve as uh, your host for this episode of Leading Ideas Talks podcast. My guest today is Allison Norton. She's faculty associate in Migration Studies and Congregational Life at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. And she's also one of the researchers who's worked with a major initiative on exploring the pandemic's impact on congregational life. The latest findings of this research initiative um, have been released. Um, and they focus on clergy health and wellness in our post-pandemic times. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Welcome, Allison. Thank you, Anne. It's great to be here with you. Yeah. So before we get into the subject of clergy health and wellness, um, can you describe the broader work of the initiative exploring the pandemic's uh, impact on congregational life, of which uh, the most recent report on clergy health and well-being is part? Yeah. So this is a five-year study. We are about halfway through, uh, and it is composed of multiple parts. So this report we're going to talk about comes from a clergy survey, and we're doing ongoing national surveys of congregations across the country, and regularly we're to, uh, producing reports out of this. So this is our latest national survey. But we also have reports uh, and research that is qualitative in nature. So there are 81 case study congregations that are partners with us in this research in nine different regions in the U.S. We did field work in 2022, and we're back in the field right now, uh, interviewing church leaders, doing focus group with the tenders, participant observation services. So we're doing a kind of two-year follow-up to see what changes have occurred in that period. Yeah, it's really comprehensive work. That's right. Yeah. And then, and then we also have a longitudinal panel. So it's a quite robust uh, picture. Yeah, so our, our, our leading, uh, our podcast listeners may recall that we've already interviewed some of your other colleagues on some other aspects of this study. So it really is quite broad in scope. Um, so the background of this newest report is, I think, the common perception that clergy are exhausted, they're burned out, they're dropping out of ministry in droves. Uh, so I wanted to be, begin by asking you, um, how true is that perception? Yeah, you're right. That is the word on the street, right? That is the right. common perception. Um, and I think what we've done in this survey is we've actually broken out into two reports. And one is really looking at that dynamic you're mentioning around clergy just contentment and the factors that are driving them to leave either or have thoughts of leaving their, their congregation or leaving pastoral ministry altogether. And we do see that those thoughts are on the rise. Uh, as we've looked at this trend over the last few years, there is a glowing, growing clergy discontentment. But what is also fascinating is that when we look specifically at clergy health and wellness, the picture is not as bad as one might think. And in fact, when we compare clergy health and well-being to the general public, clergy tend to be quite healthier. 
Yeah, so I think that was one of many somewhat surprising findings of, of your of your work that that um, clergy do seem to be quite mentally and emotionally healthy compared to the general public, even though I think you're saying that there has been a rise of discontentment as measured by people thinking about leaving ministry, not necessarily actually leaving ministry. That's right. So we asked them questions about how often they have these thoughts as well, because it's one thing I think we all wake up and feel like we want to quit our job when it's a a tough day. Um, But really, it's how often do we have those thoughts? Right. And so that's another thing that we measured so we could get a good look um, at at, you know, what dynamics are happening that are leading to clergy having these feelings of discontentment. But as you mentioned, uh, it's kind of surprising when we look at the general public and we see you know, asking questions like, I am satisfied with my life as a whole these days. Do people agree? In general, I usually feel happy. And looking at these um, items and questions on a scale, uh, clergy are doing quite well. Yeah, that's that's really good to hear. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask is whether you think age is a factor in this. Um, looking at the demographics in your study, the average age of the clergy that you surveyed is 59, which is I think very high in relation to the average age of the general populace. And from, you know, my just very uh, casual acquaintance with the subject of, of uh, clergy health and, and well-being, I think it's generally assumed that as people uh, become more mature, their mental and emotional health tends to improve anyways. And so do you think that age is a factor? It absolutely is a factor. Uh, so when we're looking at the landscape of how the pandemic has impacted um, the average age of clergy, one of the things that we do see overall is that clergy do tend to be older. So when we did our first uh, survey, we're looking at um, uh 2021, the average age of clergy was 57 and it is now 59. Uh, so clergy are uh, older, right? Uh, Yes. Um, But one of the things that this survey looked at when it comes to health and wellness is exactly what you're saying. What difference does age make? And we compared across generations. Um, And perhaps not surprisingly, a larger percentage of our millennial clergy leaders scored lower on their wellness, health and wellness scores compared to their older peers. And our boomer generation clergy were most likely to be in what we call the good or the great health and wellness category. Uh, Gen X was somewhere in between there. So there is an age gap in terms of health and wellness, but this matches what we find in the general population. So it's not surprising in that sense that what we see with our millennial generation um, and and certainly Gen Z, right, is um, matched by what we find in our survey on clergy health and wellness. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I've neglected to ask, when we're talking about clergy health and wellness, what is what is that? <laughs> you know, how, 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 do, how do you measure it? What does it look like? How, how yeah, do, well, that's how, the hard how part. How do you know if clergy are emotionally <laughs> healthy? Yeah, no, that's a great question um, because it is about what, what we're measuring, right? What kind of questions are we asking? So what we did was we started with the Harvard Flourishing Study, and they ask 11 questions um, that have to do things, like I said, about, you know, overall, I am satisfied with my life as a whole these days. In general, I feel happy. It asks people to rank on a, a scale from a one to 10, um, their own physical health, rank their uh, mental health, rank their racial, relational health, etc. cetera. Uh, and so what we did was we added to that six other questions um, that, that included some spiritual health Um, aspects as well. And then we combined all 17 of these into a scale so that we were able to have then this ranking, right, from from one to 10 uh, to compare the clergy that participated in our study. And what was great about using the Harvard Flourishing measures is it also allowed us then to compare with the general public um, because this survey, um, you know, there's existing work using these same questions so then we could have a comparison with the general public. Mm. Thank you. And I, I'm a, so I'm, I, I mean, I'm imagining that these are relatively standard measures that are used in the field. Yes, they are. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So another surprising aspect of this research is that um, a lot of the behaviors and self-care practices that are commonly assumed to enhance well-being in clergy, like taking a day off every week and being part of a peer support group or seeking counseling or spiritual direction, um, these things correlated only minimally uh, with, with health and uh, emotional well-being. Uh, and so I think there are some pretty nuanced reasons for this, um, but is it possible for you to address that briefly? Yeah, I, you're right. We do tend to think of these things as sort of the standards of clergy self-care. And I think um, one of the, the explanations, particularly when it comes to, for example, taking a day off a week, right? We didn't find um, a, a large difference in the health and well-being of, of clergy who did take at least one day off a week and those who did not. And I think part of the explanation here is that most um, I think about three quarters of the clergy in our study did take at least one day off a week. Um, so the vast majority of our participants already were right in the habit of taking at least one day uh, off a week. Um, many of them were also participating in peer group supports, although this has declined uh, over the last few years. Um, so I think about two thirds now um, say that they are participating in some kind of peer group with, with other clergy. But when we look at our open-ended comments and, and interviews with clergy leaders, it's clear that they are finding value in these practices of self-care. Uh, so the survey is not suggesting that these are of no value, having a sabbatical, taking a day off, engaging in um, spiritual direction or therapy. It's not that these things are not beneficial, um, but it's that they didn't have um, perhaps as strong of a correlation as some other aspects that relate to both the characteristics of the congregations that they're serving in uh, and some of their um a personal dynamics. Yeah, and I want to get into some of those things in a minute, but but just going back to the question of some of these baseline uh, self-care practices, I mean, could it be that these are just kind of assumed to, or not assumed, but that they, they, are, they are common practice, and so they're not going to be the variable that accounts for differences because they, they have become a, a common practice for many yeah. clergy. Yes, I think you're right. Um, they have become common practices. And like I said, it's not that they are not beneficial. Uh, we know um, from from our conversations with clergy and the open-ended comments that they are. Uh, but like you're saying, they're, they're a common practice. Um, and I think they also um, are part of what, um, you know, drives clergy um, you know, to, to seek out well-being, right? To do some of these common practices to incorporate them into their life. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the, another issue is spiritual practices. And there, I think you found a more clear cut evidence of um, certain spiritual practices like prayer and meditation and scripture reading, making a positive contribution to clergy health. Is that, that right? That is true. That is true. Maintaining spiritual practices like prayer, um, scripture reading, uh, how our respondents um, ranked the importance of their faith in their daily lives uh, were associated uh, with their overall health and wellness. So those who had decreased their prayer or scripture reading or this sense of importance of their faith in their daily lives also had lower overall health and wellness scores. And in fact, none of them scored in the great category who had, had noted a decrease in these spiritual practices. So not surprising, there is a connection between the intensity of religious practices and clergy well-being. Do you think that's unique to the calling of clergy or would that finding also hold true for people in general? Well, we have not studied that, but there are many studies, right, that try to understand the dynamic and, and the impact of maintaining an active spiritual life, of incorporating spiritual practices, religious and spiritual practices. Uh, and there is a, a body of existing research that would say that, that, that right, for, for the general person, um, that, that, that uh, having an active spiritual life um, does correlate with increased uh, mental health and mm -hmm. wellness. Yeah. So 
Another surprising um, factor to me was the issue of loneliness and isolation. Um, I am not a clergy person, uh, and I think it's easy for us, uh, those of us who are not clergy, to kind of imagine that it would be almost impossible for a pastor to feel lonely or isolated given, <laughs> given the nature of their work. Uh, and so I, I wanted to um, invite you to talk about this issue of relational wellness in clergy. Uh, what were some of the ways that you uh, measured this and, and some of the conclusions that you came to? Yeah. Well, I think we know that being surrounded by people is not necessarily an antidote to loneliness. You can still feel lonely um, because a lot of that has to do with, as we found in our study, um, broader markers of relational health. So nearly half of the clergy who completed our survey claimed to be frequently or occasionally lonely. Uh, and this was um, rather astounding to us, and I think highlighted some of the relational challenges that might be specific to clergy. I talked about how our study is able to compare with the general public and um, the, the sort of one area in which clergy tended to score lower on average than general public did have to do with this concept of relational health, right? That they, they had um, relational um, health in a way that was perhaps an antidote to loneliness. That, that, so when we look at loneliness with clergy um, in particular, uh, we were surprised, right, by how common this was. Um, and we put together a scale. You asked how we measured this, right? How did we, how did we measure this? Um, and so we put together, um, a scale of several questions all having to do with relational health. And one of them was specifically about loneliness. Um, but the others had to do with, um, questions like, do you have someone that you can go to, uh, when you need help? Um, do you, are you content with your relationships? Are your relationships satisfying? Do you feel connected to your broader community? Do you have this social networks to rely on? And so when we put this uh, relational wellness um, scale together, what we found is those that do have great relational wellness are rarely lonely. Um, and so I think that there are ways, right, for, for clergy to think about their relational help relational health and how do they um, create opportunities for greater connection to their broader communities. One of the things that came up in our stories and conversations with pastors is that they were finding opportunities to build relationships outside of their church, right? Outside of their congregation. So one men mentioned pickleball, right? I mean, he, he's joined the local pickleball group. He plays pickleball and then he doesn't have to be the pastor uh, he can be, you know, the pickleball partner. Um, so I think this says a lot about the connection between re relational wellness as an antidote to loneliness. And so maybe also having relational networks beyond the congregation. That's right. And I think another important point here is that what we learned in our work is the extent to which a clergy person feels there is a good fit between them and their members is also related. So um, for those that said there was a good fit right between them and the members, they had less relational loneliness. So some of that might might be important too to think about if you're brand new to a congregation or there's conflict in your congregation or other things that make it difficult to have this sense of good fit between you and your members, then it's especially important to find these other sources of community and connection. Yeah, well, that was actually what I wanted to talk about next, because um, not surprisingly, <laughs> uh, there are congregational factors at play as well uh, in, in um, determining a clergy person's sense of well-being. And at the risk of oversimplifying things, uh, if I'm reading the survey correctly, um, clergy persons that serve in larger churches, in vital churches, in churches that are more open to change, in churches that have a clear sense of mission and purpose, are more likely to have uh, high wellness scores whereas clergy that are serving in smaller or highly conflictual settings, uh, that's more likely to be a negative factor. And I think this only stands to reason, um, but I also think it's worth emphasizing uh, that you know, there is this connection between clergy health um, and 
uh, congregational health and vitality, and especially in an era where so many congregations are strained uh, and in decline that you know, I mean, this seems like the sort of the, the looming factor that, that has to be considered for a lot of individual clergy people as well as our systems more generally. Yeah. One of the clear findings of our study is that there is this mutual relationship between the health and well-being of the organization, right, of the church and the health and well-being of the leader. And we're not saying that one causes the the other, um, but there is a clear correlation. So like you said, um, denominational family makes some difference. Um, Catholic and Orthodox um, clergy tend to fall mainly in the good uh, uh, relational or good uh, mental health and wellness category. Um, the mainline and evangelical um, Protestant clergy were comparable to each other on kind of where they fell um, on the scale, with the mainline slightly more in the good wellness group and evangelical pastors slightly more in the fair category. Um, but church size matters too, right? The larger the church, the more likely the clergy person will have higher wellness scores. Um, and those serving in small congregations of 50 or less are most likely to have poor wellness scores. Um, and then some of those, those attitudes that maybe are, are harder um, to quantify, like the church's orientation toward change. So how open do clergy think that their congregation is to change, to meet new demands, to meet all of the challenges that their congregation might be facing? And so if a church is highly open and oriented toward change, uh, the clergy person is also more healthy. Um, if the church has a clear sense of mission and purpose, right, that relates to the, the healthiness of the clergy. If the church has high levels of conflict, um, the clergy, right, tend to have lower health and wellness. So all of these things have a mutual relationship. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I again, I think that I think that only stands to reason. Um, but mm -hmm. then again, you know, you don't have control over those factors, which is always I mean, sometimes you do, but a lot of times you don't. And so it, it seems like, you know, those would be natural stressor points, um, you know, leading to the to the, you know, idea that maybe I don't want to do this anymore if they're in a congregation that is uh, you That's know, right. not willing to change, not clear, you know, right. uh, very small, whatever. Um, yes. and, and that's an increasing percentage of congregations these days. So I, I think that that does give pause, certainly. Um, so I, I, to begin to wrap this up, I wanted to ask about the title of the report because the, the title of the report is challenges are great opportunities. <laughs> uh, and so I wanted to unpack that a bit uh, uh, because I, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think is the most significant challenge with regard to clergy health and well-being? What's the great opportunity that you see? And how are they connected, as your title suggests? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we've seen overall is the pandemic has been a driver of change, not just, of course, in congregations, but in our, our societies in many ways. Uh, and what we saw um, in the early couple of years after the pandemic is that churches did report these greater, uh, greater levels of willingness to change to meet current realities and current demands, right? There was this kind of aspect of forced change that I think was healthy uh, for many congregations. And um, and so this orientation towards a challenge as an opportunity, right? Uh, it might, the challenge might have come and, uh, or a crisis may have come, um, but it's prompted churches to, I think, deal with, address, wrestle with realities that they were dealing with long before the pandemic, but the pandemic just provided that little spark to really address some of these. So I think that's really the opportunity, right? The opportunity is for um, pastors leading congregations through change um, to, to, to sort of take advantage of this moment. Uh, now, we do see a bit of a hardening of some of these attitudes of sort of wanting to go back to a status quo, kind of normalizing different patterns, uh, which is why I think the orientation to change remains um, a factor in all of this. Um, but I think the the opportunities here are for um, clergy, I think, to 
think about what are those dynamics that are in their control and what are those that are not, as you mentioned, right? Some of these things are things that um, clergy can bring changes, right? Uh, We know that their physical health is related to their overall health, Um, that um, their financial health is related to their their overall health. Um, We know that using resources from their denominations, uh, judicatories, their region, also, right? Um, so there are there are things that clergy can do that are in, they do have control over that can relate to their financial health and be a real opportunity. Uh, on the other side, I think it's drawing a clergy attention to these dynamics around conflict, their congregations' orientation towards change, and perhaps leading right in that in that um, toward um, um, thinking about the greater health of the communities that they're in as well. So it seems like what you're saying is that that knowledge is power. The more that uh, the more that congr- uh, congregations and pastors understand the factors that contribute to their mutual thriving, the more mm-hmm. control they have over it. That's right, and it's understanding out of that knowledge that wellness requires this holistic approach that is attentive to personal practices, to relationships, to spiritual nourishment, to congregational culture and the broader systemic factors. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask one final question. Uh, I always like to uh, leave our listeners with um, an action step or a Mm to-do. And so I wanted to ask, um, based on your findings, is there one recommendation that you would make to a clergy man or a clergy woman to help um, improve their sense of health and well-being? And then is there also one recommendation that you would make to the average congregation? Yes. So to the clergy person, pay attention to your relationships. Build strong, supportive networks, if not within your congregation, outside of the church walls. Find places of meaning and purpose that are not just in ministry, but that can help build relationships with others. And this can be, I think, one way to lessen what we see with regard to loneliness among clergy. And then for congregations, I I think it's um, seeing your clergy person as a person. Right. And and um, knowing that uh, when when there's conflict, uh, when you feel stress in your own church, the clergy person also feels that stress probably more than you do. Um, th- so I think there's a, an aspect of empathy um, toward clergy um, that is important. And I think a willingness to work alongside to create cultures within the church community that are supportive of not just congregational health, but clergy well-being. Mm-hmm. Well, those are really two great pieces of advice. Um, so I want to thank you, Allison, for this conversation. Also, thank you for this report, which I think provides a lot of really good information, but but also really for this entire project of, of helping us understand where churches are and how they've been impacted uh, through this pandemic and post-pandemic uh, period. It's really valuable information that you are collecting, and I'm grateful for the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for joining us for Leading Ideas Talks. Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos.